for me, uh, one of the most heartening aspects of last year's referendum was the role of Scotland's artists and the role they played in stimulating debate. Artists and performers were active in shaping discussion about what the future of Scotland might look like, using their creativity to explore the big questions thrown up by the referendum, challenging us to reflect on our past, our present, and most importantly, our future. And one year on, this is a good time to reflect on the role that culture played, to look at the legacy of the debate and what the impact has been, both on politics and on Scotland's artists and their practice. From the high profile work and active campaigning of the members of the National Collective to a wide variety of grassroots creative activity in the communities all over Scotland, the artistic response to the referendum is what made this period one of the most exciting and inspiring times to be living in Scotland. The years since the evolution that have seen this nation grow in stature and confidence, and this is also true of our cultural sector, with a growing pride appreciation of the incredible quality, the breadth and the diversity of our culture, whether that be literature, poetry, theatre, visual arts or music. We are a nation that has always been shaped and nourished by our songs and our stories, and the referendum ha had an energising effect on our artists, inspiring a whirlwind of creative activity that provided a multitude of different perspectives on this landmark moment in our history. Equally, all this activity invigorated and enlivened the political process in a way that I must admit would never have happened if the debate had only been shaped by politicians and the media. And I mentioned the National Collective, and they were perhaps the most uh, prominent and public face of the creative movement, inspired by the referendum, bringing together a huge number of artists of all types to discuss and promote the issues through all kinds of activity, from making magazines and videos, to music and comedy events, to theatrical productions. And their long traveling arts festival, Yesterville, they toured uh, communities all over Scotland with events in Scotland's seven cities, as well as the borders, the Friesen Gallery, Central Scotland, Western Isles, the Highlands, Orkney, Shetland, the North East, Angus, Perth, and Fife. And that ensured that people the length and breadth of the country had the opportunity to participate. And they also, importantly, reached out to young people and supported and encouraged grassroots events. So it's quite interesting in the presentations I know at my local school, where my son was responsible for putting both yes and no materials um, on the boards for, for the 16 and 17 year olds, it was a visual. It was the visual, it was the artistic that captured their imaginations, what they wanted to communicate with. Also, in terms of widening the debate, very importantly, um, the National Collective were involved in, in uh, as uh, many artists were, in the active use of social media. And Glasgow University this week published an analysis of social media using the referendum, which highlighted how active cultural organisations were, and its significant interactive digital presence took an open and inclusive approach, which encouraged a wide range of people to engage in the conversation, reaching out to those who might not necessarily engage in more traditional forms of cultural activity. And also inspired by a similar tour in the run-up to the 1997 devolution referendum, it's always important to know your history, um, although I think some of us would not want to refer to 97 as a piece of history, but perhaps it is. Um, a group, another group of artists and musicians, including James Robertson and Kareem Polwart, took their listening lugs bus party tours around Scottish libraries, churches and community groups. And the bus party toured all over, from Stromnest to Dumbarton, with aim not to campaign or convert, but to engage people in conversation and ask them, what kind of Scotland do you want to see? And this, for me, was what made the involvement of artists so special. It's that imagining. If art does anything, it makes us question. It challenges us. It makes us think differently. So, as well as um, the more high-profile activity, of course, of Scotland's well-known cultural voices, such as David Gregg or Alan Bissett, there was a huge groundswell of creativity which embraced anyone who wanted to contribute. And this enabled uh, a free exchange of ideas, it brought a fresh dimension and imagination to the debate, going beyond issues of policy to ask broader questions about who we are and, our, and the country we want Scotland to be. And although many of those artists producing work in response to the referendum were pro-independence, there were cultural voices from all perspectives engaged in the debate, provoking and encouraging discussion. And a very great example of that was the National Theatre of Scotland's great Yes, No, Don't Know five minute theatre show, which invited people from all over Scotland and beyond to put forward their ideas for micro theatre shows exploring the issue of independence. 
more than 200 shows featuring over 840 performers from eight countries were performed live, not just in creative hubs in Scotland, but across the rest of the UK and even internationally, as well as being streamed online. The project was created by David Gregg, a Yes supporter, and the late great David McLennan, a No supporter. And the result of their collaboration is a clear demonstration of how the arts can articulate a multiplicity of perspectives and arguments in an intelligent and thought-provoking way. And then the festivals, of course, saw a variety of popular and sold-out events inspired by, by the referendum, from Alan Bissett's comedy, The Pure, The Dead and The Brilliant, looking at the debate through the eyes of banshees, demons and selkies of Scottish folklore, through David Heyman's one-man show, The Pitiless Storm, to Ellie Harrison's art installation, After the Revolution, Who Will Clean Up the Mess, which featured, if you recall, four large confetti cannons primed to fire, but only in the event of a yes vote. Uh, the referendum fired in artists' imaginations, however, resulting in work brimming with ideas and imagination. For what more creative act can there be than the opportunity to imagine a new nation? Artists do not, of course, operate in a vacuum. Uh, rather, they are shaped by the society around them, and they themselves shape society. All over the world, defining moments in history have inspired artists. Picasso's Guernica is an obvious example, a work of art which not only helped um, to bring the Spanish Civil War to the attention of the world, but which has become a powerful and universal symbol of the devastation of war. And culture not only reflects and captures such moments, but can also, as I said, shape and drive forward debate, acting as a catalyst for change. And the arts are a crucial means by which we document and move toward a deeper understanding of human experience in the world we live in. So in that sense, all art is political. When signing the legislation that brought into existence the American National Endowment for the Arts, Lyndon Johnson remarked that, art is a nation's most precious heritage, for it is in our works of art that we reveal to ourselves and to others the inner vision which guides us as a nation. And where there is no vision, the people perish. And so it's only natural that so many artists were driven to produce work responding to such an historic moment in Scotland's history. Artists can explore the political with a freedom that perhaps party politics and the business of government doesn't allow. Art brings different perspectives and fresh angles that can encourage civic engagement and democratic participation. Artists are able to ask questions of us as individuals and part of wider society, while standing apart from political affiliation or ideological stance. And their role is vital to the health of democracy. The First Minister um, has made clear that she wants to lead the most successful government this country has ever had. And it is the referendum that created the conditions that make that possible, engaging with those who might find conventional political discourse dry, dry and off-putting. And one of the most positive things to come out of the referendum, and something I hope will become an enduring legacy, was a remarkable upsurge of interest, particularly amongst young people, in the political process. In times of political apathy and following voter turnout, the referendum saw a rejuvenation of civic and democratic engagement with the largest voter turnout in Scotland's history. At 85%, all of us, all of us must be very proud of that. For the first time, 16 and 17 year olds were given the opportunity to vote. And in the face of cynicism from some quarters, young people willingly grasped that opportunity, not just to vote, but to fully engage with the issues and make their voices heard in the debate. And Scotland's artistic community did much to encourage the, these levels of engagement through the plethora of grassroots creative activity which went on across the country. The enthusiasm and the inclusiveness of the creative response to the referendum helped to inspire and involve young people and others who might otherwise have felt disconnected from the process. And artists helped create a wave of positivity and optimism which drew people into the debate, asking Scotland to reimagine itself, or in the words referenced by Alistair Gray, to work as if you live in the early days of a better nation. This Scottish Government wants to enable young people to continue to be actively involved in the political process. It's why we're extending that franchise to 16 and 17 year olds in time for next year's Scottish elections. 
and the passing of the Scottish Elections Reduction of Voting Age Bill in June uh, is a landmark moment for a participative democracy and the unanimous support for the bill demonstrated the widespread recognition that the doubters at the beginning are absolutely convinced that our young people can and should be able to shape the Scotland that they want to see. So the legacy of the autistic response to the referendum is a profound reinvigoration of civic engagement and a proliferation of grassroots and community cultural and polit political activity. The eyes of the world were on Scotland in 2014 and I'm proud of what we saw was political de debate which not only engaged people of all ages and backgrounds which was conducted in a remarkably lively, open and uh, civil manner. That, that impact is still being felt across the world and with my international responsibilities I meet many, many people and the mark of that, the idea of Scotland still is the land of the dialectic and the debate but we'll still take you for a whiskey afterwards and we do things in a very civil way uh, but we take our constitution and we take our politics very seriously um, and we do it in a manner which is exemplary, something that has not been missed by the rest of the world. And of course, uh, while I was uh, deeply disappointed by the referendum results, uh, this increase in democratic participation is a hugely positive outcome and one which the Scottish Government wants to harness and nurture, increasing civil involvement in policy development and implementation, empowering our country perhaps in a different way that I envisage, but that community empowerment agenda is something which I think is very ripe for this country. And whilst the political legacy of the referendum continues in the debate about shaping Scotland's future, as, it, as does its cultural legacy, we can see it today in the National Library's collection of archives and other projects such as Documenting Yes, a project initiated by photographers associated with National Collective to document the grassroots Yes campaign. The energy and optimism that artists themselves brought has left a lasting legacy of an enriched cultural sense of ourselves and our country and it's strengthened uh, a self-confidence. It's increased interest in Scotland's cultural life, both at home and internationally. And my belief and my hope is that the creative contribution does not end, but that it continues to enhance the ongoing conversation about how we shape the future for a better Scotland. So I started my uh, remarks with a quote from Yeats. I probably will end, I think, with my favourite quote, and one which I live by. I don't know what you did on, on Friday and how you felt, whether you were a yes or no voter. I wasn't quite sure what to do, but um, my, local, um, uh, my local branch organised Achille. So I spent Friday night at Achille, and what was the most wonderful moment was when all these young people arrived who were interns at the Scottish Parliament, come from uh, Scotland, took part in a fantastic Cayley with a wonderful band, Burak. If you haven't heard them, please do. They're from West Lothian, they're excellent. And it was that invitation to the world in uh, Bog Hall, in a housing scheme in Basque. This is Scotland, and they said to us, we've been here since August, but tonight, tonight feels the best welcome that we've had in Scotland. So the quote I want to leave you on with, and it's the one that I live by, is from Emma Goldman. If I can't dance, I don't want to be part of your revolution, and I want to dance, and I want to sing, and I want to enjoy culture. It's part of our politics, it's part of our life, it's part of Scotland. Thank you.